disclaimers. <laughs> this is not intended as legal advice, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> I cannot be held liable or responsible. You take, take, anyway, that sort of stuff. But one of the disclaimers I really want to say, I mean, this is a half an hour presentation. Um, uh, a basic law degree takes three years. So it's really just a tiny little snapshot of stuff. And what I want to do, or one of my objectives, I guess, would be simply to raise a bunch of things, and I'm not going to be able to even touch on all of the things that would need to be th thought about, but raise some of the issues that are worth thinking about, um, in, either at the, or hopefully at the design stage, um, but also at the stage of if you're making decisions about what um, app or service to adopt or employ, uh, at, at different decision-making stages, or even at the stage if you're a user of using something. These are some of the things that you might want to think about. And so my objective really is um, to, uh, to give you enough information that you may have a sense that um, there's an issue or a problem that you might want to explore further, that you might want to talk to your legal team about, that you might want to get a legal team. Um, and so that's uh, generally the uh, objective and the disclaimer. So law is, um, in many respects, about relationships. And certainly in this context, it's about relationships. Um, and so one of the things that you need to do when you're looking at and you're, you're thinking about legal issues in this context is to think about what particular legal relationship or relationships you're talking about or you're thinking about. So for example, a city may be thinking about uh, entering into a contract with a particular service provider for a smart city service or a smart city's app. And that there'll be a relationship um, defined in legal terms between the city and the service provider at that point. And so that's one relationship. And there are going to have to be certain things worked out in the context of that particular relationship between the city and the service provider. Um, the city that um, uh, enters into a contract for that service may then have a relationship with the users of that service. Um, and so that's another relationship, and it's a relationship the city has to think about in terms of how it wants to define that relationship with, its, with users. It's something that they might have had to think about also at the city service provider stage because the kind of relationship that they have with the user may depend on the terms and conditions of their relationship with the service provider. Um, and then, of course, you may have a service provider user relationship. So if the city contracts with a service provider um, and the service provider uh, is the, the party that's collecting the, the personal information, for example, or collecting any uh, user-contributed content. Uh, there may be uh, a separate set of relationships or, or terms of service uh, between the service provider and the user. So in any one context, you may have a variety of different relationships, and there are going to be legal issues with respect to those different relationships. And so it's important to go in and think about what kind of relationship are we talking about here? Who are the parties in the relationship? Um, and uh, just given as an example, because uh, the BC Wildlife Federation app is going to be one of the, the things that you'll be thinking about. And I was, I was looking at the, the app and the terms of service. John is smiling because, <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, and, and one of the things that I find interesting is I, you know, my question was, uh, who is my relationship with if I download this app? And according to the terms of service, it's with the BC Wildlife Federation. But I just watched John stand up here and talk about uh, us, John, and his team collecting the information and distributing it. And as far as I know, you're not the BC Wildlife Federation. So why is it when I go to download the app, I, I am told my relationship is with the BC Wildlife Federation, and I don't know about this other relationship, and it's not transparent. So relationships are important. Thinking about those relationships are important, and those are part of the legal puzzle. I mean, who are you sharing your personal information with? Who is setting the terms of that, um, uh, rela of, of, of the engagement between you? So um, just a yeah, public law, private law, legal academics, which is one of the reasons you may not want to spend a lot of time with legal academics, could talk <laughs> endlessly about the public-private divide, the public-private distinction. They could argue about what is or is not public law and what is or is not private law and how the two concepts are anyway. So, uh, one slide for our purposes. Um, and all I want to do with this slide, and I can see the print is awfully small, uh, is to say, uh, and this is really very, very basic, um, that there are some generally applicable laws, uh, which include regulations and bylaws, that est establish certain principles, rules, requirements that are of general application. And so some people call these public laws, some 
people argue about whether they're a mixture of public and private. But anyway, it, these, uh, these laws can include things like um, uh, privacy laws, um, uh, competition law, uh, other uh, human rights uh, laws, and so on. And these laws are publicly accessible and available. I put a URL to Canley's site, which hosts all sorts of, um, essentially their objective is to have publicly available, free through their portal, access to all the provincial, federal, uh, uh, provincial and federal laws, municipal bylaws, uh, uh, case law, tribunal decisions, basically a one-stop shopping for um, the laws uh, in Canada. Um, and so that's one type of law. Um, but parties have considerable freedom to use contracts as well to define the terms of their relations with individuals. And contract law uh, and tort law are considered areas of private law. Um, and they're private law in part because they're how people define their relationships with each other, with each other uh, but they're also laws that govern um, the consequences of those relationships. So for example, if you harm somebody, if you behave in a negligent way and you harm someone, you may be liable in tort law for the harm that you've caused that person. That's considered private law. The private law that's most interesting in the context of apps is of course contract law, because it's through contract law that people establish the private law of their arrangements. And so contracts are essentially a legal text, a legal document, which defines each party's um, obligations uh, reciprocally with respect to the each kinds other. of contracts we're most used to are the ones where we're basically told these are the terms and conditions of service. You may not recognize that as a contract because you don't feel that it's consensual, but in fact you do agree to it. It is consensual. It's a contract. And that's the private law between the parties. So that's what terms of service are, and they basically set out the legal boundaries of that particular relationship. Those are private. For the most part, if you enter into a contract with your neighbor or with a with a with a um, uh, somebody and uh, another person, there's no requirement for you to publish that contract or share it with anyone else. That's a private arrangement. Terms of use are published simply because that's in order for you to be held to have consented to them, you have to be given notice of them. So you tend to find them publicly accessibly on websites. Um, otherwise, there's no obligation to publish those types of contracts, uh, but they are contracts. Um, freedom of information legislation may require public entities to disclose the terms of their contracts. So if a, if a municipality contracts with IBM, for example, for some sort of smart city service, um, it may be that you can seek access to that contract under freedom of information legislation, but parts of it will be blacked out or not disclosable because it's protected by, as confidential commercial information or under some other, some other basis. So, Contract is private law in the sense that it's between private parties, but it's also private in the sense that it's not always public. You don't always get to know what the terms and conditions are. So that was uh, just a very uh, brief overview of those issues. So I want to get into some of the legal issues that come up in the, with respect to um, apps and services. Um, privacy is obviously a big one. Um, it particularly, obviously, where there's any collection of personal information. So one of the first questions you have to ask with privacy is, is this app or is this service collecting any personal information? So what is personal information? Name and address, yeah, probably, right? Personal information, your name. Um, what about your IP address? Is that personal information? If you go to a website and it collects your IP address, has your personal information been collected? Even if you don't, there's no registration requirement, you don't have to fill in any form, it's just collecting your IP address. I heard a yes, but I didn't see where it came from. Here? Here? Okay. <laughs> why, why would you say it's personal information? Um, because it's not something that people can find out through other channels, right? Like a phone book. Um, and again, I guess it would be personal, but it's not just like accessible. I, I don't know. Okay. That's why I wasn't really saying yes. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> it could be tied to another, it could be like cross-reference with another database where um, your name and address is tied to, mm -hmm. and your credit card number is tied to your address. So that makes it personal information? Yes. Okay. Yeah? Have we not determined that IP addresses are not personally identifiable information in the courts? Have we? Isn't <laughs> uh, that like file sharing cases and that? Uh, Supreme Court of Canada recently said that an IP address, in, in a criminal law context, is personal information. But it was a big a matter of debate until the Supreme Court of Canada resolved it. There was a lot of debate about whether an IP address is personal information or not. Um, you can tie an IP address back to a particular individual. 
Um, and the, the context in which it came up in, in, the, in the criminal law context was the, um, uh, the uh, police obtained IP, ad uh, an IP address linked to the sharing of uh, child pornography online. And they wanted to get, they went to the ISP provider and they wanted the information from the ISP provider. So there's a question of whether um, disclosing the name and address of the subscriber that was linked to the IP address was disclosure of, of uh, personal information, whether the IP address constituted personal information. Um, and and the, the answer was yes. Um, but obviously it has to go all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. It's a very complicated issue. Um, but, but I think that illustrates how complicate, complicated this whole issue of personal information can be. It may be, for example, that if you design an app, you're thinking because there's no registration requirement, the app is not collecting personal information. Um, the definition in privacy, private sector data protection laws and public sector data protection laws in Canada, the definition is information um, that can be associated with an identifiable individual um, uh, uh, either on its own or in combination with other information. So in a big data context, of course, it, you can take, all, you can take a, uh, if, if you have gender and postal code, uh, age, gender, and postal code, you can link it to, I, I, to a particular individual. Um, and so, you know, what constitutes personal information is...